In the last video, I went off topic to introduce my new 3D printer and to document the process of getting accustomed to what it does with the Hexilamp 1.0 and some speaker wedges. Today, we're back on course talking about this 3-inch subwoofer from Tangband and my experience printing a fully functional enclosure which I'll demo toward the end of this video. Stick around! These days, miniature sound systems are all the rage. For better or worse, the quintessential boombox of yesteryear has been replaced by the modern Bluetooth speaker. This is how we share the listening experience outside the car and away from the listening room. It's not ideal, and we can certainly bitch about it. We can also take matters into our own hands as we have with DIY home and car audio, especially now that a decent 3D printer will cost you less than an equally decent table saw. How awesome would it be if one day soon the portable speaker scene embodied the spirit of car audio in a sense that, rather than a generic off-the-shelf speaker, each of us had a unique, custom-tailored miniature stereo to fire up at the beach or to demo for our fellow enthusiasts. And it's with that preface in mind that I'm experimenting to see what kind of sonic goodness I can get out of this tiny driver. For anyone interested, this is the SU Series W31876S from Tangband. Not a very memorable name, so from here onward we'll call it Fred. And at $38 through Parts Express, links down below, this is an excellent starting point for anyone looking to prototype miniatures. Right away, let's address the TS parameters along with a very handy and perhaps familiar piece of software, Harris Technologies Basebox Pro. And while I'm not a fan of the template-based workflow, I absolutely love the parameters tab for quickly and easily validating the driver specs. Let me show you what I mean, because this is absolutely critical if you're going to design anything for anything. If there's one thing to know about the numbers that make up the TS parameters, it's that they're contingent upon one another, and I cover this at length in my TS Parameters Explained Part 2 video, which I'll link down below. But here's a brief example. QTS, or total Q, is calculated by dividing the product of QMS and QES by the sum of QMS and QES. So let's say that we have a QMS value of 2 and a QES value of 0.5. There's obviously only one thing that our total Q can possibly be, and that's 0.4. If it's anything else, that's a mathematical impossibility, just as if we had a circle with a diameter of 16 centimeters and a surface area of anything other than 201 square centimeters. And Basebox Pro lets you verify all these cross dependencies on the fly, so if anything comes up red, then you're pretty much looking at a fudged parameter. That's actually the word that Harris Technologies uses in the manual. In other words, it's time to address the manufacturer like, come on, come on, check that shit! Because anything designed around the wrong parameters is, in and of itself, inaccurate, which can easily translate to a lot of wasted wood or fiberglass or filament. And quite frankly, ain't nobody got time for that. So let's quickly plug in the numbers from the manufacturer and. <laughs> things are looking pretty fudgy. So in the interest of moving this along, here's what I came up with using the Dayton Audio Woofer Tester, and this is what I'll use for the remainder of the project. So, once I transitioned over to my design software and modeled a few potential arrangements, it became apparent that Fred is going to rely on a hefty bit of air mass to achieve any sort of base extension. And since my goal was to limit the footprint of the enclosure to the area of the print bed, the solution emerged as this meter and a half long folded waveguide. Looks like a transmission line, and to an extent it operates like one, but with the addition of the tiny coupling chamber, it also bears the properties of a base reflex, complete with a 24 decibel per octave roll-off. Here's the predicted response, which we'll verify later. I drafted the basic two-dimensional layout in SketchUp, then used it as a reference for the three-dimensional model completed in FreeCAD. Afterwards, to eliminate the issue of sagging print layers along the upper arch of the waveguide in the chamber, I split the model in half so that each part would print on its back, as it were, and to increase the amount of bonding surface between the two, I gave the split some curvature which, aside from its purpose, looks pretty darn spiffy. Also, since this is just a rough draft, I made use of this gaudy silver filament as I have a lot of it just sitting around. Now then, the adhesive of choice for this type of material is CA glue, which becomes brittle as it cures and doesn't really serve as a gap filler, so instead I went with a two-part epoxy, JB Weld as it happens, which turned out to work just fine. 24 hours later I popped the speaker in and now we're all set to do some tests. Right away, here's the setup. I'm using the Zoom UAC2 as my DAC, with the DSP set to pass the signal down to an auxiliary output without any correction. The signal is then amplified using the Emotiva BPA1 and carried over to Fred. 
Above all else, I wanted to see how closely the actual response matched the predicted one, so here we go with the sweep. All things considered, this is pretty close, certainly enough to inspire some confidence in PLA as a viable enclosure material. However, I did promise a demo, so let me deliver on that, and the closest I can come to relaying the experience is through my ears, by which I mean the mini DSP binaural microphone. So if you're looking for that holographic sound, now would be a good time to find some headphones, preferably ones that don't skimp on the bass. And just for context, I'm going to switch back and forth between my 3D print and this generic Bluetooth speaker. Enjoy! Just to verify, right, left, all right. Your hate moves like a freight train, steady with a heavy